You will recall that last night in speaking to the splendidly researched Deputy Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, Daniel Wild, he warned that due to the Perrottet-Keen emissions policies in New South Wales, 138,000 jobs are under threat. Now, I repeat, this is thoroughly researched. The IPA team have been in northern New South Wales, along with Jack Bulfin, the CEO of this television station, ADH. And as the research proves, it's all very well to be teal and green in the elite suburbs of the capital cities. But as Daniel Wilde said, and I quote, many regional communities face the risk of being wiped out as local industries they rely on for employment and the rest of the country relies on for energy and food are to be destroyed due to reckless emission reduction mandates. Now, I've already made reference about this nonsense to Professor Judith Sloan. And I've warned about this for years and years. I've called it, remember, the National Economic Suicide Note. But then we do have a Liberal government in New South Wales that looks nothing like a Liberal government, splashing money around on almost anything. Add to all of that the voice and so-called energy policy, the mirror image of the Labor Party. And you know that they've learned nothing from the Morrison defeat. Indeed, one of the architects of that defeat, Yaron Finkelstein, is apparently on Perrottet's staff. What the hell would he know about winning elections? The one authentic Liberal who wiped the floor electorally with the opposition was Tony Abbott. This bloke won 25 seats from the Labor Party in two elections. Of course, the left will demonise him because they fear him and his own Liberal Party reject him. Yet the Liberal battler in Struggle Street loves him. Yes, there were problems with his government. But as every intelligent analyst of the time would know, he was white-handed from within. Even today, Abbott is the most formidable exponent of true liberalism in this country. I venture to say if he contested a seat in Western Sydney, he would walk in. Why am I saying this? Well, Daniel Wilde warned us last night that one of the great catastrophes we face is this business about energy policy and climate change. Tony Abbott recently addressed this climate change issue, speaking in layman's language, arguing that, quote, there was little point in reducing emissions in ways that drove up our cost of living or just sent our emissions offshore as industrial jobs relocated to places that were less environmentally scrupulous, unquote. In other words, investors don't have to put their money in Australia when nitwit governments think that they're going to save the world. Tony Abbott, like me, doesn't deny that climate change exists. And he cites the Ice Ages, where climate was radically different. He cites the Roman and medieval warm periods, when crops grew in Greenland. The mini Ice Age of the 1600s, when there were regular ice fairs on the Thames River. The climate changed, but he makes the point. All those changes were independent of any man-made influence, let alone under the influence of carbon dioxide which apparently they don't like, but it's the source of all plant life. Sensibly, the former Prime Minister asks, how much should a country such as Australia be prepared to pay to reduce our emissions, given that other countries such as China and India will not reduce theirs in preference to strengthening their economies? And that nothing Australia does, he said, on its own will make any appreciable difference, unquote. Tony Abbott is right when he said, and I quote, for years now, any discussion of climate policy has been poisoned by fear-mongering over supposed unique catastrophic weather, such as that creating last year's New South Wales floods. He made the point, though, that I've made many, many times that, quote, while last year's flooding in and around Lismore genuinely was unprecedented, it's not really surprising that records do sometimes get broken. On the Hawkesbury, where flood records at Windsor go back to 1799, the four floods of 2020-22 were matched by the five floods of 1860-61. As he points out, at 13.9 metres, last year's flood peak was almost 50% below the all-time peak of 19.7 metres in 1867. 